All right, guys, we are back. Okay, when I last left off, I had just completed game one of the best of five finals match of the ninth online seven point singleton tournament. And uh, I had just lost game one, actually gotten pretty pulverized in that match against uh, Mikel Fee, a, a French player, uh, playing his pink weenie deck, which I discussed in an earlier deck tech. And I'm playing my blue white control deck with quite a large number of creatures, actually. And uh, basically, Mikel had, was in the driver's seat from the very early part of the game, resolved an early land tax, drew some extra lands with it. The, uh, the presence of the land tax really constrained my ability to develop my board. And uh, he was just sort of ahead the entire game. I was really on the back foot. And really, the critical point in that game was a missed Chaos Orb flip when I was at 8 life, which left an Order of Leapor in play. And the Order of Leapor not only dealt more damage to me, but was ultimately responsible for my <laughs> demise at the end of the game. And uh, yeah, a heartbreaking game to lose. I don't really know if I, had, if I had made the orb flip, there was still a lot of the game left if I had managed to survive that early onslaught and I may have just wound up dying to burn spells. But I never got that far due to the mistake. And uh, so we're about to start game two here. Um, he's ahead now one to zero. And uh, one thing I did notice actually is that um, Mikkel has his four, his, uh, four six-sided dice up in the front, each one displaying five. Uh, five points of life. And then back by his right hand, actually, there's another set of four six-siders, which are an indicator of my life total. And in fact, throughout our entire match, I never actually noticed that at all. I never noticed that he was actually keeping track of my life by his right hand. If you look on the side of my screen, I've got a little cursor over here. You can see there's two dice here. So this white die, which actually is red as well, is what I'm using to keep track of my life total. And then this green and orange die is Mikel's die. So I'm just I'm so old school, I've, I've just never deviated off of using dice. I use them to this day, even in, even in casual events like pre-releases and stuff. I just like having them. And uh, it's kind of nice to be able to just physically pick up the die and spin it and so on. Um, occasionally, it does cause problems, though. And this match actually is one where there's a small discrepancy in our life totals. We'll get to it later. The commentators mention it several times. But it is something that I'll have to correct the record on. You'll see me adjust my life total every single time I take damage. But unfortunately, Mikkel misses it a few times. And because I don't even notice that he's tracking my life throughout the entire match, I never am able to actually correct him. So I'm not sure how much it will affect the decisions that he makes throughout the game. Um, but it is a factor. And uh, you'll, again, you'll hear the commentators talk about it as, uh, as the game progresses. So I'll correct the record whenever there is, in fact, an important discrepancy. So uh, we're about to kick this off. Um, there's going to be a little bit more shuffling. The commentators actually just got through talking about it. And the commentators are Thomas Meddens and Ken Fritz. Um, uh, uh, Thomas Meddens is also known as Timmy the Sorcerer. He has his own channel and uh, he, where he comments primarily on old school stuff. He's from the Netherlands. And Ken Fritz is an uh, American who resides in Hawaii. Uh, but they just finished commenting the, la the first game. And uh, they've been chatting a little bit while we've been shuffling. We're probably about a minute and a half, two minutes into shuffling. And I always like to really make sure that my deck is mixed thoroughly. And um, they were just discussing whether or not there should be sideboards in this format. And... Um, I think some really, really excellent points were made about it. It's just sort of inviting all the kind of narrow, lame hosers that exist in alpha and stuff. And kind of, it, it just feels like it's against the spirit of the format, given how diverse it is in the first place. You don't really want to be, have people bringing in COPs and flash fires and just random stuff that just makes it impossible for the opponent to play the game, cards like Gloom and stuff. So I actually think it's a net gain for the format as well that there, in fact, are no sideboards. But that's important because our decks are exactly the same throughout this entire match. So without further ado... You guys are in for a treat. This is one hell of a second game. In fact, it's so long and uh, it's such a grueling battle that I'm probably going to actually have to divide it up into two videos. So just a forewarning about that, I will, uh, I've already sort of picked out a point where I think will be a good jumping off point to segue into the second game and, or the second half of the, of the second game. And uh, I'll let you know when that happens. So without further ado, sit back, get comfortable, get ready for seven point singleton, old school, Best of five, finals game number two. So we uh, we moved to game two. But interestingly enough, we didn't see any X spells coming, right, from Miguel? No, we didn't. So, and, and that's the thing. With the, if Mikkel had gotten one of the X spells, Brian would have been dead a couple turns earlier. Um, but... Brian was the whole game. He was on his back foot, and I'll tell you that's exactly what Mickle's deck did to me. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, you just can't win casting a four mana control magic and taking a two mana knight. Yeah. 
Yeah, he's absolutely correct about that. That that play that I had to make where I did use control magic, which is an obviously extremely important and powerful resource against a two drop, was really kind of just set the set the tone for the rest of the game. And I did actually have to make that play because of the land tax. I couldn't play any more lands to, to play my bigger stuff because I just can't let my opponent playing red white tax with impunity and basically thin all of the the non interactive cards out of his deck and just draw nothing but but good stuff. And I mean, obviously, if I have a 2-2 for a striker, it does stop a lot of his offense. But at the same time, that's a card that's really best suited for grabbing one of the bigger and more dangerous threats in the deck. And it was sort of just a sign of how, of just as Ken perfectly described it, I was really on the back foot pretty much the whole game. Um, Ken's deck, incidentally, the one he's describing, where he got run over 2-0, was a blue-black deck, which would have actually been, I think, quite tough for me to beat if he and I had played in the semifinals. But fortunately, he... He played Mikel, I think, in the semifinals and got mowed down by the creatures. Just black is just, it's so much worse in this card pool than white at dealing with a, a rush of creatures. You don't, you have the Abyss, but his deck, um, his deck had a ton of creatures in it and wasn't running the Abyss. So he had a lot of stuff that was troublesome and problematic for control decks like Hypnotic Spectre and Phyrexian Gremlins and things like that, which are really good against blue-white, but just totally ineffective against a red-white beatdown deck. Yeah. Um, it, it's just, it, you can't do it because by the time you control it, you've already taken four damage. And um... but that's also the, like the brutal thing about a card like Disenchant, where you've got the answer to that uh, with two mana at instant speed, and you get to untap. Well, when you cast the control magic, it takes you a whole turn. Yeah, right. You're tapped out the whole turn. You can't counter anything. You know. You... <laughs> yeah, the to the point that Thomas is making there is actually, I think, one of the reasons why. Control Magic as a card, as powerful as it is, has been woefully unplayed in a lot of old school singleton decks. And uh, in fact, a very, very common thing that used to happen during the Type 2 era, uh, when Type 2 first appeared, one of the most powerful decks, powerful archetypes in that format was Green-White Urnam Armageddon. And uh, a lot of people trying to play Blue-White would use Control Magic because it was so good, and you'd have that exact scenario happen. You'd tap out to play Control Magic on the guy's Urnam, and he would just disenchant it and untap and cast Armageddon and blow you out of the game. So that sort of kept the card... Uh, from really being a top tier constructed card in, in a lot of decks, except for maybe sideboards over the years. But it does really shine in this format because your opponent only has one disenchant and only one Armageddon at most, and it costs them two points to run Armageddon. Yeah, and to make matters worse, he's he's commandeering a tapped creature. So yeah. that tapped creature now doesn't, uh, you know, it doesn't, it, it's not open as a blocker. So it, it's funny because Brian got just about the start he wanted. He needs that Felwar Stone. Um, to be able to keep pace, but Mikkel's uh, land tax, I think, wow. you know, yeah, yeah. Even though he was flooded, but his land tax was letting him pump and answer. Um, I think the land tax. I'd, I'd like to say it's the difference, but you know. Well, keep in mind, we both are playing with land tax. Tax actually, it's one of my. It's two of my seven points. Uh, although I did make a, a statement about this in my blue white deck tech, where I think it was clearly a mistake to include the card. And to budget two points in it. The, the thing, the big difference, of course, is that um, Mikel is playing a deck where the average CMC is probably right around one and a half to two, and my deck is considerably more expensive. And there's just no way that I can leverage land tax the way that he can. So the card is extremely effective in his deck and quite weak in mine. Maybe the difference was really the the lightning bolt of that night. Yeah. The other point, um, Ken's talking about how uh, Mikel had a uh, a lightning bolt for the night that I stole. But um, he, he is totally correct in saying that I had a pretty much nearly ideal draw, short of, short of me having all the perfect deck-stopping answers in hand or drawing them relatively quickly or getting something crazy like mana drain into Brain Geyser. I did have a pretty ideal start. Turn two, Felwar Stone. Turn three, Serendip Free. It's hard for my deck to really draw better than that against him. And he just had the perfect answers. So knowing that, knowing that I, draw, I drew perfect mana, I had white, white, blue, blue by turn three as well as Serendip. And uh, acceleration, and I still got destroyed. Was was rather demoralizing. Very early. Um, yeah, he could, that he could keep the aggression. Yeah, right? it, yeah, it was just an it was just an overwhelming beatdown. I mean, let's be honest. It was overwhelming. Looking, yeah, I'm just looking at his at his deck list again, and there are actually quite some double whites in his deck. So it's understandable yeah. that he's playing with a lot of mana sources. Yeah. Well, and you know. A land draw late in game isn't bad for him because he's he, it's going to put him you know he's, he he can cast a fireball for like I think he could have fireballed for seven at the end of that game, um, you know or detonated and cast the granite gargoyle. I mean it's it just kind of gets. Um, 
every land Mickle plays is is essentially one life lost for Brian. Yeah, and I mean, and, and, he, he's playing with with earthquake, fireball, and disintegrate. So those are three X spells. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and, and when you have your your opponent like lower than ten, you know, I'm just saying something that is later in the game. Then you're absolutely right. Every land can can matter. Yeah. Yeah. In my match in round in the semifinals against Mickle, he goes. You know, fireball for seven, a counter spell on the very next turn, disintegrate for eight. You know, <laughs> just, I can't do anything about it. I just okay, I just shuffle my cards back into I, my deck, and I think you can see it as well that he's chosen to play a soul ring, which is four points in this format. And remember, it's uh, for people that are not used to this format. It's seven point singleton, so you can spend seven points on cards that cost you points. It's actually a very interesting thing that he's pointing out. I almost completely forgot about the fact that Mikel had Sol Ring in his deck. Uh, he budgeted four of his seven points on a card that makes two generic colorless mana every turn, which is a universally powerful card, but kind of it feels about at its worst in the, kind of the deck that Mikel's playing, which is filled with stuff costing double white and a lot of things that pump using white mana as well. Of all his deck construction, construction choices, it was actually one that I felt was a, the, the one that I agreed with uh, the least because I just felt that there are so many other things that cost one and maybe two points that you could you could run in those slots instead that I think would improve the consistency of the deck. And you'll, um, I'll let you guys keep track of how many times he actually managed to get lucky enough to draw Sol Ring in this match. And Sol Ring yeah. is really steep with four points, right? Because what, what's in this Ancestral Recall again? Ancestral is four points, just to remind us. So looking at my hand here, uh, my hand is a pretty much auto-keep, and it's, it's actually extremely similar to the hand I had in game one. The difference, I think, is that I've got a fourth land instead of that Felwar Stone. But um, from memory, I believe I've got four lands, and I've got good colors as well. I think I have um, two white and two blue again. I also have Serendip of Freed in my opening hand, which is a, just a powerhouse against um, Kel's deck. And then I have Preacher, and I've got Argivian Archaeologist. So I'm very, very happy to see Preacher as well. It's very fragile, but if it's able to stick, it is one of the most insurmountable roadblocks for Mikel's strategy. If I have a Preacher in play, it's like... If you've ever played Commander and you've had uh, the Dolphin Shackles and a bunch of islands in play, it just makes it impossible for your opponent to really attack you because you can steal one of their guys and block with it. Maybe they might lose two guys in combat to deal a couple points of damage to you, and that's not a sustainable strategy. Drawing Archaeologist early is kind of crappy because I, ideally I want to draw it later in the game when I've got a few artifacts in the graveyard, ideally the Chaos Orb, and I can start recursing them. But with Serenity of Freed and Preacher in hand, they're both incredibly powerful against Mikel's deck. It's going to come down to kind of what happens early on and which one of those two creatures makes the most sense to play first? Ancestral is four. I think four, the, right? Um, so basically they're and, telling you... Ancestral and Lotus yeah. are four. Wow. I think Mind Twist is just three. And like Brain Geyser, for example, which is in, in, in Brian's deck, which is a great card, but it's only two points. So... And it was one point um, up until October 31st. Wow. And I yeah, think, I, I actually... Think they, so twice in a row here, he opens without a turn one creature, which is extremely lucky for me. And obviously it didn't matter last game. He had plenty of powerful threats on two and lots of answers. But <clears throat> in the testing that I've done in this matchup, uh, my opponent's ability to beat me with the red-white deck goes down significantly if he's not able to get a turn one creature going. So as soon as I see that, and seeing that I'm holding both Serendip and Preacher, I'm feeling, feeling pretty confident in this game already. A fireball got a point. That was also a new a new change. I I think that that's valid. Fireball, you fire it, fireball is just a reason to splash red. You know, like yeah. I could see Brian using a fireball in his deck. As 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 crazy as it sounds, you know, if he's got all the duels. Um, also, also when you play Felverstone and you know that that most players in Singleton play red, right? Because that's yeah. those are the decks that win the most. Then mm -hmm. Flower Stone is even more useful as well for that for that single red for this. Yeah, they're both right about that. And honestly, um, as I've said before, version 1.0 of this deck, of this control deck, was actually four colors, and it ran plenty of red. I ran the whole gamut. I didn't run Pyrotechnics, but I ran Lightning Bolt, Fireball, Disintegrate, and Earthquake, as well as a Sedge Troll. So I think I had five red cards. And I just had so many games. It's really, really hard to run red spells off just dual lands. So you have to, because there just aren't very many dual lands. And I had to play, uh, I think, a Hammerheim as a mountain as well. And I just had too many games where I was just drawing the red man instead of drawing a second blue or a second white. And ultimately decided that as nice as it would be to have a little bit of reach and, and a card like Earthquake, I just wanted to go with higher consistency as well. Because I feel like in a singleton format, in an answers-based deck, you really just have to prioritize consistency over the potential of what 
running more splash colors might might give you. And on this turn, of course, I'm going to play a third land, and I'm faced with the decision now. He's got Pikemen in play, and I can play either Preacher or Serendip of Preet. And I don't know whether or not he has red mana here. It's really hard to know in this this uh, this red white deck. Actually, it's better to call it a white red deck. It's one of its biggest weaknesses, actually, is the fact that it doesn't run very much red. I think it only runs seven sources of red, and there's a sizable portion of games where you don't have red mana early. And uh, with that in mind, I decide that I, I kind of want to play the Serendip of Preet here, depending on what he does. Worst case scenario, he has a red mana, and he might actually have to use two cards to get to get past the Serendip of Preet. If he attacks with the Pikemen alone, I will absolutely block it, because outside of the range of Lightning Bolt plus First Strike, and that still deals with both a Lightning Bolt and a turn of attacking, I don't really want to have the Serendip of Freedom play dealing one damage to me every single turn, because that's kind of doing Mikhail's job for him. And in terms of which creature I'd rather survive, or rather have survive, absolutely it's the Preacher. So with that in mind, I ultimately decided to just go with the Serendip of Freedom. It saves me a point of damage immediately. If he doesn't have an answer to it, then that's great. I'll just follow up with the Preacher and start attacking for three in the air. If not, uh, and he's able to deal with it, I can follow with the Preacher. And if he can't kill that, he's going to have a hard, hard time winning the game. Splash. Exactly. Ooh, but let's have a look. We've got Pikeman, which, as again, it's a card I love, but you don't see often, right? Banning and first strike yeah. from the dark, one white and one. Yeah, and you know, it's funny because I look at Pikeman and I say, this card is terrible because he's got a band with another first striking creature, but in Nickel's deck, it's packed with fir with first striking creatures yeah. or creatures that can gain first strikes. So it's it's good. It works. Let's see. Brian, looks like, no, he's not passing turn. He's playing a land, of course. Tapping through, tapping out. Again, woohoo, the Serendip. Wow, this is great. Let's see if Mikel is great. Answer. I agree. <laughs> well, he he plowed it immediately. It, but it, that's another oh, plow, another, another plow. Oh, again, oh, yeah. Again. <laughs> wow. Yeah, in a way, it's interesting. He's got plowshares, which sucks, obviously, for me. And I, I do gain three life from it, in a way. I was actually, Mikhail's running Spirit Link in his deck, and one of the worst things your opponent can play on a Serendip of Freed is a Spirit Link, because not only are you still taking the damage every turn, but they start gaining life from it. And he can totally ignore it in the attack step, which means that I'm just going to be, it's like I've got Cursed Land in play now forever that gains some life, and that's it's pretty horrible. As bad as having the Serendip Plowshared, it's, I think, substantially worse to have Spirit Link played on it, although I guess I'd still get to use it technically as a as a blocker for a while. But having deterministic one point of damage a turn until you can deal with your own creature is kind of a, a bad spot. And I'm not, I'm not too sad to uh, to gain three life here as that's sort of like getting a healing salve. Wow, that is... I wouldn't say it was so lucky for Brian to find it early Serendip again, but it's not lucky. Yeah. Luck yeah, is Mikhail is the luckiest finding an answer. And this is, again, like, you've got a one instant speed answer to something that costs Brian three mana and makes, makes him tap out. Then we see yeah. the Priest again. Yep, and you know I I hate to I hate to beat a dead horse, but I like turtles. And if Brian had that <laughs> giant turtle, <laughs> it is a tortoise, mind you. <laughs> but yes, I agree. I love I love either one of those shelled reptiles, turtle or tortoise. Either one uh, would be amazing. And in fact, I think it actually is a creature type turtle, using the uh, modern creature tribal taxonomy. It went from being a tortoise to a turtle. I don't. Uh, it probably mines quite a bit. They are distinctly different animals. But either way, it would be amazing to have the 1-4 blocker in play right here. It would just shut down his entire offense for the foreseeable future. It's 100% the reason why I'm running that creature. Yeah. Bring us the turtle! We need the turtle! <laughs> <laughs> okay, we, have, that's uh, we actually have, we've got 60 people in the chat, by the way. So, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, oh, this is a preacher? Beautiful art between the creature. Looper. All right, so it's actually interesting. I, I was paying attention to his hands right there, and this is this is one of the big disadvantages and kind of one of the main drawbacks of playing Magic remotely. It's just a lot harder. One of the things that I pay a ton of attention to when I play Magic for real, you know, that, notice that my hand is down, face down on the table. Every time I take, I finish my turn, since my hand is obviously not going to change between when I uh, when I end my turn and when I untap again. I focus 100% on my opponent's eyes and on their hands when they draw a card because people communicate a ton of information when they draw a card, particularly where their eyes go. And you'll notice I can't see Mikel's eyes, which is, it just makes me feel like I'm kind of flying blind when I play magic remotely. But you'll notice, actually, I paid attention right there. I believe that he drew the mountain that 
turn right off the top there. So his deck delivered red mana exactly when he needed it. And uh, yeah, that sort of, you're about to see, deals with the, pre the preacher threat just fine, which I played on purpose second, hoping that it would live through the turn. The preacher is great, but there's Mikkel. He found the red source. He's going to kill oh, the preacher. No. I, you, yep. The reason I'm saying oh no is not because I'm for Brian or anything, but I would have loved seeing a preacher take over a priest. I would have loved to see that too. That yeah. was what I was looking yeah. forward to, but it's not happening. Oh, a preacher take a priest. <laughs> yeah, man. That was that was a dream. It's not happening. Uh, he's kind of swinging here. Is he got Okay, so I'm going to pause here. You see me reach over. Mikkel tells me to take two damage. And you'll notice that he has three white mana in play and an Acacia Priest, which says pay two white and one generic to give any creature in play plus one, plus one until end of turn. And he elects not to pump it here. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm honestly a little bit unsure about what his thought process is. I think it'd be really interesting to talk with him about it. But you'll see this as kind of a common theme throughout the game. And uh, just for consistency's sake, I think I'm going to, I think I'll mention every time that I feel some, some damage is missed. I, I know that it, I'm sure he has his own reasons. I, I think probably it's because he's got either Disenchant or Divine Offering in his hand and just wants to keep mana available so that he can Disenchant or Divine Offering, something I might do, and then untap and have all of his mana available, which is definitely a valid reason. The only problem is, is that I don't, I don't, I can't necessarily answer anything that he can do right now with an artifact and he'll have the opportunity to just deal with the artifact or enchantment back on his turn and every point of damage in these games really matters every single point right now i'm at 22 life and it seems like i have a lot maybe not pumping for one point of damage won't really have an impact on the game but as this game progresses you will see that a few missed points of damage here and there starts to really add up and could could and and, and certainly would have actually been quite decisive um as as the game goes on going to pump. If not, he's probably going to play something else. So he hits me for two there. He didn't pump, so maybe he's got a, a disenchant or a divine offering in his hand. I mean, I don't know if Brian pays attention to that, but Brian's pretty intuitive. He, he tends to he notice does. when I... people leave a mana open, you know? I definitely do. I mentioned that in the last game, of course, with the, uh, the whole timing of the Chaos Orb scenario. So I was very... Obviously, I noticed him miss the opportunity to pump, and I was quite curious about what that meant, thinking of it certainly telegraphed to me that he had Divine Offering or Disenchant in his hand. The other card that he has at instant speed that he can play for three what for white mana is the card Army of Allah, which gives all attackers plus two, plus, plus zero. It's basically just a finisher, but that's, there'd be no reason to leave mana untapped to hold Army of Allah because it's not a reactive spell. It's entirely proactive. So I'm seeing the three mana representing Disenchant, Divine Offering, but I'm actually much, I'm much happier to have saved a point of damage there. No. I think he's... You know, he's, he's this mathematical brain, right? So, ooh, Arcan. this is interesting because there, there are no artifacts in the bin, right? So he's just playing it out. Right, but Archaeologist is a 1-2, if I'm not mistaken, which... It's actually just a 1-1, one, one, and this was, uh, this was obviously the weakest play that I was capable of summoning. It's a 1-1. One, one. It's better than nothing, I suppose. It's better than just keeping five mana anemically untapped with no reason for it. But my hand right now is pretty garbage. I think I just have two lands in my hand right now. And uh, that might be it. I think I might have two lands and something like Copy Artifact. My hand is just effectively useless. And I'm just going to have to hope that my deck delivers the goods before I take too much damage here. It is good to be at 20 at least. Shh. Means that it can effectively block the pikeman if it doesn't ban. I believe but it's a one-one. Here's one. where banning comes into play, which is so goofy, right? Like it's this forgotten, antiquated ability in modern magic. But you you'll see right mm -hmm. here why banding is a thing. Banning is ridiculous on defense. It's a it's a one-one the archaeologist, which is kind of okay, strange well, because because Sage of Latinum is a one-two, for example. Okay, my bad. That's that's probably what I got it confused with. Yeah. Probably. So the archaeologist is not playing any defense. Definitely not. And the truth is, it wouldn't anyway. At least not in any way other than chump blocking because of the three untapped white man, or well, the three untapped men, and the potential to pump anything that I block. So he can make either one of these attackers into a two-two if I decide to block it and just outright kill the archaeologist by spending three mana. So it's unlikely I'll be blocking at any any point in the foreseeable future. Maybe he wants to lure some damage out or something with it, or it's just the best option. It's really just the best um, option. He still has some blue open to counter. You know, and it's funny, because 
if Brian had had the archaeologist in his. So once again, there, uh, he uh, declines the opportunity to pump a second time. That saves me a second point of damage. So uh, currently at 18, kind of effectively at 16. Opening. Or, I, I think he would have played that before the preacher um, just to uh, draw out the lightning bolt, you know? Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. There might be some merit to that, but I honestly don't think that, um, I don't think that Mikkel would have just randomly bolted a 1-1 archaeologist when I had no artifacts at all in the graveyard to retrieve. It would certainly make sense if I had something good in the graveyard, Galen Tome, or an Icy Manipulator, or a Jam Day Tome, or something, obviously a Chaos Orb, something that I could recur. And uh, in retrospect, actually, the fact I'm playing or giving archaeologists might mean that future versions of this deck should run Aelopile. Just having another thing that you can recur that actually impacts the game is pretty handy. There's also the card Triskelion, which I didn't use because uh, I just sort of felt like I had a little bit too much high end anyway. But those are all cards for, for future consideration. I just, I, I literally had nothing better to do than playing the archaeologist here. And uh, I really wanted to get the preacher on board just so it could stick. I don't think that I would have been able to uh, to bait a lightning bolt by just playing the archaeologist. Yeah, so, so you're saying you top deck it probably. At least yeah, I heard I heard Brian's been playing for a while, so I'm going to defer to his judgment here. Yeah, I've been playing a little while. Yeah, he's 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 seen some matches, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the archaeologist gets in for a point. I guess I'm, first, I'm, I'm already blood in this match. Ah, first blood. I'm on the board at last. For Brian, Brian that's yeah. the first damage, right? Wow. That shows how much yeah, that, that he's just been under pressure nonstop. Yeah. I mean, he needs, if he can find his moat, that would be ideal. Yeah, oh, would be. yeah, moat. I mean, but it's funny, you look at Brian's deck and you say, what's the best card in his deck? So you notice right there, actually, you see me reaching down to uh, to twiddle that that plateau a little bit. This, this was just <laughs> entirely a desperation play here. My hand is just garbage. I have nothing interactive right now at all. Nothing that I can play that can impact the board state at all. So all that's really left to me is to just try to bluff something, which is why I, I, you can't hear me on the video, obviously, but I audibly asked him, do you want to pump? And I reached down and, and sort of mess around with the plateau a little bit, making it look like I'm thinking about casting plowshares. And I kind of got the feeling, actually, from the way the first game played out that um, Mikkel may not have known every card in my deck. I can hardly blame him because the deck lists were published fairly the game, and he probably has better things to do with his life than memorize all the cards in my deck. But he may not know that I don't have light, uh, something like Lightning Bolt as well. And uh, anything that I can do to try to just get him to think before he pumps his guys um, may actually pay some dividends down the road. It certainly doesn't cost me anything to mess around with the plateau a bit before deciding not to do anything. And uh, maybe it just gets in his head a little bit. I mean, I got to try something because my hand is certainly not carrying me through the game. Deck. He's got so many cards that can be the best card in his deck. Moat is fantastic, but if you look at Mickle's list, he's got a tremendous amount of flyers in, in the Gargoyle. Mm -hmm. He's got Thunder Spirit, you know, so he, he can come over the top if need be, but if a Moat would definitely... At uh, least for now, it would kind of get him away from the constant pressure. Yeah. A Scout. Uh, an Engaging Scout that can give for a strike, right? One and tap. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, not too bad. I mean, I think among the, the creatures, I talked about this in the in the red white deck deck. Among the creatures he's playing, this is certainly one of the weaker ones. But uh, Acacia Scout can give you pay one mana, one generic, and give any creature first strike. That can include itself on defense. You notice uh, Mikkel elected to keep three mana untapped again, saving me yet another precious point of life, which I am quite grateful for. <laughs> I actually think we talked a little bit about Fallen Empire earlier, and of course they were toning down the power level, but when you look at the complexity of Fallen Empire, they kind of up the stakes, I feel. Because yeah, there's totally so much that. combat going on with Fallen he's, Empire. He's so so, much, yeah, Thomas like, is so correct about, about that. Complexity yeah. in Fallen Empire. Even you know, with combat. the banding, with the first strike being a really big theme. Also, counters were like really big for the first time in the Fallen Empire set. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And, and all the pumping that's going on. It's quite a complex... Uh, set. It really is. Yeah, it's funny that counters kind of skipped a uh, skipped a few sets there, you know, because I don't think that there were any counters in. I guess antiquities, right? Had some in, counters in from divine intervention. Yeah, true. That's a good point. Yeah, that's actually a valid point. I mean, I think that there are legends had it. Ha yeah, I guess the um, 
I guess active volcano, those those two cards don't actually counter anything. There is remove soul in legends, and homelands, of course, had memory lapse, but definitely counter spells took took a little vacation. I think there were probably were some concerns about making a critical mass of counters. Obviously, they made, in my opinion, the best counter spell of all time in Legends in the form of Mana Drain. That's debatable with Force of Will. I think Force of Will is probably a better card in general, but Mana Drain is more powerful, um, and that's quite an important distinction. But it's an interesting conversation that they're having about that, certainly about the complexity of Fallen Empires, which was such a intricate and interesting set. It was just that everybody was just drunk on power from the sets that came beforehand. So when Fallen Empires came out, everybody kind of looked around for crazy stuff, like the things that had been in Legends. I guess the Dark had kind of meandered away from some of the most powerful things, but there were definitely powerful cards in the Dark, like Blood Moon and Ball Lightning. So people were looking for cards on that caliber in Fallen Empires, and it took a while for people to really understand the best cards, and, and most of the best cards in Fallen Empires are commons. If you think about Hymn to Tarak and the Pump Knights, for example. Anyway, uh, you'll see Mikkel here is attacking now with two creatures and leaving his scout back, which in my opinion is an interesting decision. We'll see what he does after combat, and I'll talk about it. So he's swinging in here. Ryan's going to go to 14. Uh, so, I mean, this isn't, again. this isn't a real fast clock, but it it also looks like Ryan's been somewhat... All right, so you see him passing back to me uh, again there. So, again, no pump, which saves me yet another point of damage. And the scout didn't attack too, which is which was quite perplexing me. Obviously, I was very, very glad for it. All I have on defense is this little humble uh, Gideon Archaeologist. I have to think that Mikkel must have thought that the creature was bigger. Um, maybe he thought that it was a 1-2 or something, and that would explain why he was always attacking Banded. But because of the Vacation Priest, he can actually attack with all three creatures here. Two of them banded together. You'd probably want to ban the scout and the... Uh, well, actually, you'd probably want to ban the priest and the pikeman together just because the priest is so valuable. And then send the scout in alone. Sure, it can't give first strike, but the priest can protect it against the Argivian Archaeologist blocking. I can't block anything, which means I take three points of damage a turn plus an additional pump and actually take four a turn. So I actually, I saved two life this turn. What flooded, which, you know, could prove fortuitous in the future if Brian's able to rip the right card off the top of his deck. He's going to do something here. I almost said that book. The paperback. The paperback. Uh, Jalen Tome arrives at last. All right, I've got the something going on. The soul of Iceberg Slim. <laughs> so, what? Don't do it. <laughs> right. Take a look, man. It's a good book. Okay. So I think uh, at this point, any land that Brian draws is going to go straight to the bin and, and hopefully get an answer. Definitely. Um, no block again. But no he's, at, he's at 12, so he's he's scrambling right now. I don't think... You know, I'm not going to say it's a must win, but... Ooh, there's Atlantex again. Ah, man. Yeah. So there he's got Lantex, and I did not have the luxury of this game of just holding lands back to see what happens. I mean, as much as I would have liked to, but I, I feel like the only way I'm really getting out of this game is if I draw into something big and expensive and powerful, like Brain Geyser. My, my graveyard has one card, and it's just Preacher. And, uh, yep, he's got land tax here as well. I have no counter spell for it. I certainly would have stopped it if I had the ability to. Um, I don't know if I would have countered a mana drain land tax. I probably would have actually just, I need to keep him. The only thing that's probably going to keep me in this game is if he just draws some big expensive spells that aren't particularly effective because his hand is choked on, uh, on big stuff and he doesn't have any mana. So I would have needed to keep land tax out of play. But I have been definitely bought some extra time by the fact that the uh, scout didn't attack and he didn't pump a second time. So I've gained another... Effective to life, which will buy me some more time. Yeah. And so what's going to happen now is Mickle's going to fill his hand with lands and, uh, you know, load up for a big fireball. So Brian's got to stop this bleeding, and he's got he's to draw something useful. Due to the glare, I can't see what's in Brian's graveyard. Just a preacher. No, neither can I. Huh? Yeah, just a preacher's. But that's like wow. That's Obliterated by sunlight. You know, it's like, I discard land tax and I said about I, I just okay. commented how bad it was. Yeah, I mean that's that's not gonna be useful. The paperback makes makes you you know puts you into some tough choices at times, but in terms of just cycling cards, it's you know, it's a no brainer in singleton. Yeah, you can even do some oh. goofy stuff, right? And decide to put an artifact in the bin because he's got that archaeologist. There it is. Back. This is fantastic. Ice manipulator. Such a powerful card. 
Okay, so I need to I need to talk about this play here. The commentators are actually gonna in a, in a minute are gonna talk about the mana that I tap, but based on the board state, based on the fact that my opponent has three one one attackers and, that can band together and a pumper and the ability to move damage around at will, the ice manipulator is really just gonna stop at a maximum one point of damage per turn. It is in fact just really a bluff here, uh, something hopefully to draw fire away from Mikkel. When I played the Icy, I announced it in a way that made it seem, I think, more intimidating than it really was. So I gave it a little bit of kind of extra verbal fanfare, hoping that he would actually take interest in this and kill it over my Jalen Tome. And you'll notice I've left two blue in the City of Brass untapped. I could have tapped, say, a Tropical Island and left Savannah untapped. But what I really want to do is I actually really wanted to kill the Icy Manipulator here because I feel like I don't really have the time to both bring the Jalem Tome back and replay it and use it again under this kind of a pressure under this kind of pressure when my life total is already down to twelve. And I really got to hope that he just goes after the icy manipulator, kills it, and uh, I'm able to continue to draw cards safely with Jalem Tome. So I never had any intention whatsoever of using archaeologist to return anything at all, given the amount of pressure that I'm under, which is why I just left the uh, the bluff of two blue mana up right there. Yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. And with the archaeologist now, Mikkel is, you know, he's got to answer both the the paperback and the IC. So let's see. Maybe he's got a dust to dust in his hand. He's just been salivating. <laughs> is he playing with dust to dust? Is yeah, he... I think he dust to dusted two of my items when I had a when I had a guardian beast in play, which was, you know, fantastic for me. Um, Thomas will correct the record in a little bit, but in fact, Mikkel does not play Dust to Dust in his deck. He wasn't running that. He actually wasn't running Shatter either. He elected to have Detonate be his only non-disenchant, non-divine offering way to kill artifacts. Loved it. <laughs> oh, wow. That is brutal. Because yeah. he also removes yeah. him from the game, you know? So your archaeologist right. is worthless. Yeah. I yeah, guess... Dust to Dust is a really fantastic card in this format. I don't see it in his list, by the way, but I could be missing it. Oh, you don't see it? No, I don't see it. But okay, maybe it was a, maybe I got dust to dusted on a previous game. Yeah. I just recall it happening <laughs> while my beast was in play, and it, I, I was, uh, I was pretty sad. Never wow. been so happy to have an icy manipulator disenchanted. It's a very good card. So the disenchant, it's it's a temporary answer, and then unfortunately for Brian. He made the error of yeah, using yeah, yeah, white yeah, yeah. mana. Ah, oh, man. Well, we don't know if it's in Brian Brian's defense. We don't know if it's an error because maybe he's got like a counterspell in hand and he wanted two blue. Yeah. Although yeah, he, then he had a city of brass. Yeah. There's basically no scenario where I'm going to take a point of damage to bring an icy manipulator back into my hand under this kind of pressure. I just need to draw cards off Jalen Tome. That is the only way I'm going to get out of this situation based on the strength of my hand. And obviously the commentators don't know this, but um, certainly I'm, I wanted the Icy Manipulator to be destroyed and had absolutely no intention of returning it to my hand at all. I just need to draw. That's the only way out of this. He's got a, if, he's, if Brian's got a counterspell, he, he can't use it on anything except the big fireball or the big disintegrate. Totally right? true. Because Perfect. Perfect we're, read. We're approaching that that event horizon where Mikkel just has so much mana that it's game over um, <laughs> if he's able to get one of those X spells through. Well, that's always a problem. Like counter magic control, like a control deck in general is so much better when you're not under pressure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he's been right, you are. Me... <laughs> yeah, thank you. I know, I'm sorry, I'm stating the obvious, but <laughs> I, I play with Tim's, right? So I've, I've, been, I've been there lots of times. <laughs> So he's getting in for two more, and this is this pressure is is becoming real. He's uh, on twelve, so okay. Hmm. I mean, maybe he just blocks with the archaeologist, because if they're banded, he prevents two damage. Yeah, but he wants to get that ice. Oh event. no! So I take another two there, rather than the uh, the potential four that he could have dealt. Although he's got five man in play, he might want to have a, a rather a more expensive follow up there. But at least the scout can attack to to push some more damage on me. Um, I think so far, at last count, I might have now avoided nine total damage, something like that. But this, yeah, I mean, I think I, at this stage in the game, I don't think I'd even be able to tap my City of Brass anymore for mana um, if uh, if things had gone a little bit differently. But we'll see what his follow-up play is. 
Because the scout could give the priest yeah. first strike. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. no, he's patient Jeff Lemire's. He's got oh look at the little Lego spear. That's, so That's cool, man. Yeah. What a good card. Yeah, cool. The javelineers are special. That is awesome. They're, don't is, sleep on him, man. They're so good. Oh man. Okay, so he's wow. he's searching for an he wants a wrath of God, I think. I do. Yeah, <laughs> I it's love in his that. deck. That'd be great. That'd be sweet. He wants a wrath of God. Um He'd love an earthquake for for one, you know, like any. Uh, I don't. Not in the deck. It, I think when Brian rebuilds this deck, he's going to be thinking about earthquake and fireball. Yeah, and like splashing like. a little bit of red. But I think that was maybe one of his things that he didn't want to do. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, it looks. It seems like a, a great option right now because I've got three sources of red in play. But that's that doesn't happen very often. And I I had so many games when I was testing when this deck had red in it where I just could not draw red mana. And uh, I needed, I'd have multiple red cards in hand. Instead of drawing, instead of drawing any source of red, I would just draw another red card and just lose a game that I, I might have been able to win if I had had spells I could cast. So as I talked before, about before, I just prioritized consistency over potential. I think that he wanted to try to build it without red. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure though. And this is interesting. He's actually tossing that copy. And if he has more time, that copy artifact will be brilliant. You know, get the icy, copy the icy. But he's under so much pressure that he just, I guess he d doesn't have the time to do all that stuff. Yeah, well, unfortunately, he can't dog ear. Um, he's just got to move past it. Let's. Ooh, there it is. Cool. That's oh, I love oh, how gleeful cool. Thomas is. That's fantastic. Is it too late, though? Because Brian's at 10. Oh, your turtle. Oh, <laughs> there it is. That's what I said. So watch how well the turtle works because. I love their comments. This turtle is, got, is a one he's four got a, roll. If anything, the turtles the turtle has to soak up four damage to die, and that's four damage that Brian's not taking, which will give him the opportunity for the old man to steal something. And if the old man can steal the pikeman, wow. <laughs> and then he can he can also block in a band, right? Brian can then start blocking in a band, and that's just crazy. Because the way banding yeah. works, if you block, you can band all your creatures together and you can assign the damage. So Yeah, that's an incredibly important point. Uh, when people, people who have played with banding way, 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 way back in the day before it was retired as a mechanic, probably just for being a combination of, of being both too complicated and having too, too many weird fringe cases involving things like protection and trample and flying where banding was involved, but also banding just resulted in crazy stalemates for the exact same reason that Thomas just pointed out, which is that if you have a single creature with banding on defense, it effectively gives banding to your entire defense, which means your opponent could swing in with, I don't know, two five fives or something. You have a bunch of ragtag creatures and one bander, and you can just put all of them in a band in front of one of the attackers and distribute as the defender. Normally when you're blocking, when you're multi-blocking your opponent, the attacker gets to decide where his creatures damage goes but if all your if you have just one bander you as the defender gets to decide where all of the damage goes and you can put one point here two points here two points here one point here and pretty soon all of your guys live and their guys die it's it's pretty ins it's a pretty insane mechanic it's great on on offense but it really really shines on defense so he's totally right about that i would love to be able to steal the pikeman with the uh with the old man of the sea so that is pretty one. sick he wants to preserve that archaeologist, but right now, I mean, does he trade it for two banded damage, keep his turtle around, and stabilize? I mean, I, chump blocking with the archaeologist isn't out of the question here. Definitely not. I am That's actually expecting Miguel maybe to use the javelin mirror on the archaeologist, and then Brian in response is going to use the archaeologist for one time to get the icy back. That's a possible play. Yeah, it could definitely happen. I, yeah, yeah, you're right. Or he could. Yeah, and if he doesn't, he'll chump block. But I think making the the javelinier use its token is is also uh, good for Brian because it kind of puts his turtle that much further away from being, you know, first strike and shot, right? Yeah, it's kind of hard to follow what Miguel's doing at the moment, by the way. His screen is frozen. Okay, we're back. He's back. Okay, that's good news. Yeah, so he just went and filled his hand with more land, and now he's going to... What is he going to do? Something. Oh, Falling Star! Falling Star. Look at that. That is a card that 
I think this was actually the first time in my entire magic life, which now spans, what, 27 years, that I've ever had anybody play Falling Star against me. Back when it was legal, uh, it was just completely overshadowed by Chaos Orb, and there was really no reason to play it at all. So it never it never saw any play at all. And it's it's one of the cool things about this format, seven-point old-school singleton, that cards like Falling Star turn into all-stars. Uh, it's three mana. You flip it onto the battlefield, and... Any creatures, this is the actual text on the card, any, any creatures that are touched by Falling Star when it resolves on the battlefield take three points of damage. And uh, there's an additional side effect about it, which is, which is about to matter, that I didn't know about because I've literally never played against the card in my entire life. It has been eroded in this format so that rather than just being thrown on all of your opponent's creatures and potentially killing all of them, you're actually only able to designate two targets for it. And you actually flip at the two targets simultaneously. So you don't flip at one and then flip at a second one. You actually have to put them side by side and then attempt to throw the star at both of the targets. So Mikel is going to use the falling star. I have no response. And he's going to, he's going to determine that he's going to be tossing it at Old Man of the Sea and the Giant Tortoise. And that is going to lead to some confusion due to the fact that I don't even know what falling star does in its full effect, other than the uh, the three damage that it deals. So we'll get to that when it shows up. Oh, oh no! Oh, this could oh, be horrible! Because no. with Falling Star, the errata is that he can put his... Uh, the creatures cannot over overlap, but right. he, he can put them together. So he can, he can put the, the turtle and the archaeologist and the old man of the sea kind of together. Yeah, and of course, he can only target two of them, thanks to the errata. <laughs> Thank God. But he can yeah. hit them all three at the same time. And then the, the the super interesting thing about Fallen Star is even if it doesn't kill that turtle, it will... Oh, with the javelin it, here. Yeah, of course. He can kill it. it. Will, but it'll tap the turtle. Oh, it'll so tap he it. Really? Even, he may not even need Look to at this kill it. He could just get in here for this four and right to here. ten. But it looks Boom. like he's going, I guess, for the archaeologist and the... Yeah. Wait. Okay, so he, did he hit the turtle? Yes, he I did. I think he, he had to have hit the turtle, right? He, yeah. But he only swung on two. I don't know why he didn't put all three of those creatures together. And if it hit the turtle, it should tap the turtle. So there you go, right there. I really, really wish I could have heard the commentators during the game. And, and unfortunately, there was a bunch of people watching. There were about 80 spectators, I think. And a few times, um, procedural things happened and people said something that actually popped up on our screens. And unfortunately, nobody said anything here because it would have actually affected the outcome of the game very slightly. I didn't know that Falling Star taps all the things. And of course, if you tap a giant tortoise, it only gets its three health bonus when it's untapped. So it's a 1-4 that took three as far as I could tell. And that's why I didn't immediately put it into the graveyard. I didn't know that it was tapped. Obviously, if if the creature is in fact hit by a falling star and gets tapped and takes three damage, it's a one one that took three. So it is extremely dead. And uh, nobody said anything, unfortunately. And the language barrier between uh, Mikel and me prevented him, I think, from communicating that. So he sort of indicates that the turtle's dead. And I say, it has four health. And he thinks for a little while and he goes, okay, well, I guess then I'll just finish it off with a javelin ear token. And we proceeded. But it was unfortunate that this happened. It obviously won't happen again. But I had in, in my defense, I'd never played against Falling Star before. I couldn't read his copy of it, and I just thought it dealt three damage to the two targets and uh, didn't do the whole tap-tap thing. Um, do, do you want to pop in there and ask what exactly happened? Yeah. I'm because the it, it should be tapped. Or is he reading that to Brian right now? I'm just going to give them a second, right, to oh. see what, what they're Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, so I'll send them. So he finishes off with the javelin. No, no, no. Oh, it oh. doesn't matter. It's It's... It, it's it's moot point at this, uh, at this point. Oh, because he's using the javelin near to, to kill the turtle. Due to the fallen star yeah. damaging, but not killing it. And he's used the javelin near to kill the turtle, and now he's attacking. And I'm yeah. expecting that he's going to now use the archaeologist as a chum block and then tap it to activate it to get the icy back. Yeah, I think that that's the... Oh, that's he's, the oh. he's not. He's taking the damage. No, nope, I cannot afford yep. it. The icy does so nothing. I need, I need the top of my and deck right now more. Way more important yeah, I guess than I so. think. I mean, but maybe he's in he's in top deck <laughs> mode and he'd rather rip something off the top. He knows that the icy won't. Um, that is true. Win, that is true. That's exactly win right. the game. Yep. That is true. Yeah. But he's on eight, and if he uses his yeah. his city, right? Then yeah. Well, seven. I think he figures he can just chump block next turn. But I think if Mikkel 
You know, you're right. He's, he's... Okay, so I'm going to pause right here, and this is actually kind of a, an important point in the game as well. You notice I'm tapping City of Brass and Savannah to use jail in time. They see me reach over and adjust my life total. I'm actually now at seven life and not at eight. And unfortunately, Mikel doesn't notice this, and he doesn't adjust my life total on his side. And as I said before, I'm not even aware that he's keeping track of my life throughout the game, so I don't correct him. So we're now, we now actually have a small disparity in life totals that hopefully doesn't change any of his strategic decisions, but it will matter in terms of assessing a particular range of potential threats to end the game. He's preferring using the book to find an answer, probably that, that um, Wrath of God you were talking about. Yeah, he needs Wrath of God or, or maybe Balance if he's got it. Does he have balance? I do not. Not running. Let me check his list. Um, that does sound like a Brian Weiss. He's got a Wrath of God. Um, I don't see a balance in here. And I'm not running balance. I talked about this a little bit in the Blue-White Singleton deck tech video, but for people who haven't seen it yet, the reason I'm not running balance in this deck is because, for one, I don't have a lot of permanents that are ignored by it. I have a huge mana base and, and really no artifact mana except for the Felwar Stone, which is really where... Balance can be abused when you play a bunch of artifact mana like Moxes and Fellow Stones and so on, and then you cast Balance and blow up a bunch of their land and most of their hand. And I have a lot of creatures in my deck, too, for a control deck. I think I'm running 10 creatures plus the factory. And uh, with that many creatures in my deck, it's I can very often get in situations where I can't really kill their creatures with Balance either. And I just feel that the card is too too unlikely to get me back into a game where I'm not already super, super so woefully behind that... Uh, that the balance is kind of going to destroy my hand. My opponent plays a bunch of small little weenies and I have to cast balance and kill a bunch of land and cards from my hand, which is really just an awful, it's an awful effect and will pretty much, I mean, it's, it's basically a playing, a playing not to lose versus playing to win decision. And I just feel the card is probably just too inconsistent, at least in my, my specific build on control or my take on control to be effective enough to, to warrant the cost of uh, one point, which is what balance costs to run. Yeah. I don't think he's got much, in the way of outs, you know? If he's got a Spirit Link and he draws a Sarah Angel, I mean, but how many cards does he have in his hand? One? I think I might have two. I think there are more than one, but it's hard to tell, yeah. Wow. What is he going to do? Yeah, I... I think Mickle's got this game wrapped up. He's that, got more that, mana. That falling star was just such such a killer because was so Brian was finally kind of getting back back in control, or back in control, but getting in control for the first time, I guess you should say. So now he's main phasing the paperback, which <laughs> is not is not a good sign. Um, it's a good sign for Miguel, I guess. <laughs> oh no, he's playing the planes. I, I, See which. I, I, when he draws something with the paperback and then plays, puts a planes into play, um, it it means that he's he's kind of giving up. I, I think I think he's kind of done here. I don't know what he could possibly answer with. There's a few things left. Yes, he's fortunately, going to again, use the land tax. Yeah, all the lands just pouring it's out so of the It's so annoying when you have a player who has an active land tax against him. It is very annoying. I agree. Yeah. Like every time he uses it, you're like, ah oh, man. So it's funny because Falling Star is in, I, I think the version that Mikko played was in Italian, so he probably doesn't even know that it taps the creatures. I think he actually um, did know, but I think... After it tags them, you know, if it gets anything, it, it, it taps it, which is it, in a really cool side effect of Falling Star because it lets you kind of bum rush your opponent, tap all their stuff, um, and then, you know, swing in with impunity. Definitely. And I was also kind of surprised that he didn't put all three together because you're allowed to do that, like as long as they don't overlap. Yeah, only two. Yeah, yeah. Only two creatures. Yeah, make a little Stonehenge out of them um, and then, it's, you know, try to get all three. Exactly. Same it is possible. But it was a really nice two for one. So now he's just going to attack with, oh, he's going to leave his scout behind to get first strike. So Mikel attacks here in a band, which is actually a, a really a big boon to me. I'm, I'm, I've reached the uh, chump blocking phase of the game at this point with my life total at seven. And uh, he, he, of course, still believes that my life total is at eight. Um, but I'm, I am, in fact, at seven. And the fact that he's attacking in a band again with, a, with the ability to pump any of those creatures is just a huge boon to me. It allows me to block two damage off the uh, Argivian Archaeologist. And he didn't send in the scout either. And, and as far as I know, oh, that's right. He pumps one time here, but he doesn't pump a second time. And uh, yeah, still gaining and saving life points all over the place. 
which is literally the only reason I'm still in this game. So quite grateful for it. Yeah, but he, he banded him again, um, which I don't know that I would have done, right? Because now he's just no. allowing both of them to get blocked together. Yeah, why ban? Uh, exactly, exactly. Saves Brian one damage, right? So he's going to use the priest to bump the javelineers, make it a 2-2. Two -two. Oh, okay, so he's going to return... Yeah, he's probably going to block and return the IC. Okay, so then he takes two from the javelin here. Uh, I'll have to see two how much he down to five. What he did? So he paid three. Okay, so it looks like Brian is at six now. He only took one point of damage there. I took um, two, two off the javelin. Yeah, I think here. they forgot the to add the city of brass damage earlier, but that's been a few games ago, uh, a few turns ago. Okay. Because he was still stuck on eight on, on Mikel's, but I didn't notice. But yeah, at least I would have he's now I would have had Brian down one. I don't think it's gonna make a difference, to be honest. One life point here. It could matter. But what I think actually that Miguel, Miguel forgot is the way banding works, both creatures need to have first strike to have first strike. And priest right. doesn't have first strike, so he should have used one more mana to use his scout to give his priest first strike. At long last, Wrath of God. A real hard solution, a hard counter to this board state shows up. The Jalem Tome, my desperate digging with it, delivers the goods, and at least buys me a somewhat short reprieve against my opponent's seven-card hand and gigantic mana base while I'm at five life. But better that than being dead. Yeah, there it is, Wrath of wow, God. Oh, okay. Wrath of God, okay. <laughs> so now what Brian is looking for, he's looking for a spirit link. If, if Brian can get a spirit link on the like an azure drake or something brian can climb back into this game but right now mickle is looking to rip a fireball yeah, a and, disintegrate and, and, anything off the top of his deck right ken is so right about that in fact it's amazing how many of these test games that i played wound up being a uh, an azure drake with a with a spirit link on it it happened probably at least six or seven times it just seemed to, those two cards just kept coming up over and over and over again in testing and i would just chip my way back up into uh, double-digit life totals and often uh, take over the game with it. So he's not wrong about that at all. Unfortunately, as much as I'd love to have Spirit Link, I also need a big creature to go with it. And currently, I just my deck has not delivered anything big and defensive or offensive in the creature department, which is kind of unfortunate. Right, and because of the land text, every turn he takes out three cards that he doesn't want to draw, right? And he's exactly. upping the chance yeah. and he's finding one of those answers. So, but maybe, maybe, you know, Brian has a counter spell in hand still. I don't believe I do, actually. Yeah. I think at this point I do not have counter Or a mana drain <laughs> and a brain geyser. Yeah, I would. That would be... <laughs> that, would be that would be quite a play. But you're yeah, right. I, don't, I, mean, I, don't know, I don't know what is going to help Brian climb back in other than Spirit Link. Um, because he's just in too low a life to, to mess around against this, this deck that is just packed with X damage spells. That is true. But it actually, yeah, it's just a surprise that he's still in this second game. Finding that Wrath of God was perfect. Yep. Look at that hand of... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's the hand of a G. Yes, <laughs> land tax is pretty damn good. What is he going to okay. do? Yeah, he's counting. He's counting. Uh-oh. I think, right? Okay. I mean, when you see your opponent start going one, two, that's three, four, good. five, six. Yeah, it's not a good sign. Oh, <clears throat> maybe I mean he could reverse. Uh, okay, wall of swords. That's oh okay. no, this is great. This is great for Brian because if the first thing he casts is maybe he's trying to sucker out the counter spell, you know? Yeah, maybe, but or maybe he just doesn't have anything else, which is hard to imagine since his hand is full. But of course, there. But see, that's the thing. Actually, it's 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 very funny. Actually, how land tax can be deceptive this way. I think we're about ten or eleven turns into the game, roughly. And uh, assuming that Mikkel drew three or four land in his opening hand, which is based on how his mana development worked, I think is, that's basically what he started with. He, he's drawn a million cards out of his deck that are all lands, but he actually hasn't had that many draw steps to draw business spells. And I think he's played 11 or 12 spells so far this game, which accounts for nearly all of the regular draw steps that he's had, assuming that he drew a couple of lands naturally off of the top of his deck before Lantax got going. With that in mind, actually, it's entirely possible that
that his entire hand at this point is nothing but lands. And when he plays the Wall of Swords, I mean, obviously, I, I'm not liking my chances in this game. I don't believe I have any counter magic in hand at all right now. So I'm pretty much a sitting duck and just hoping that this Jalem Tome that's been out most of the game is going to keep me alive. Uh, so I'm fully expecting to just be expelled to death at any moment. And when he plays Wall of Swords and starts shuffling his hand around, trying to figure out what lands to discard, I, I just, I was astonished. I couldn't believe it, but I actually suddenly felt for the first time in the game that I might actually have a shot. There are lots of lands in there. You probably yeah. will have to yeah. discard a couple. Oh, he's ending the turn. Okay, so he's so Brian, wow. this is great. This is That was the first turn, I think, in a long time that Mikkel didn't push some damage across. So Brian is stopped the bleeding and hopefully the book can get him back into it make a game of this this would be a, a really fantastic comeback if brian's able to find what he needs he already got the wrath of god um which is a christmas miracle oh yeah <laughs> but when you are drawing two he cards a turn has, you can get, the, you can uh, get to the miracle draws. Magic that he hasn't played at all so he still has that there are some powerful cards in so it really, really, you saw me pause a long time figuring out what to discard there. I actually drew Jam Day Tome off of the Jalem Tome right there. And as much as I want the Island of Wok Wok, it is, I haven't seen any of the of the flyers that are in um, Kel's deck. And so I know that the Island of Wok Wok is actually a pretty nice defense against what he might have, a, a whole range of things. It doesn't, it doesn't stop Shiv and Dragon completely for reasons I'll describe later on. But it does stop Thunder Spirit and it stops Sarah Angel and it stops Granite Gargoyle Cold. So throwing away a defensive tool like this Kind of painful, but I feel that the uh, the other cards in my hand are just more important and give me a better chance of actually pulling the game out. His deck still, right? I have to I have to think that Brian's holding on to this is interesting. A Discarding, you would think that, but at this stage in the game, I still have no counters. I would have whack whack because I think it's quite yeah. Then again, yeah, it means that what he's got in his hand is better, right? You know? So no 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 land or anything, or else he would have discarded that. Three mana. I have to think about every <laughs> land I'm having okay, here. He I, go for I, I see. Or Azur Drake. I don't know. <laughs> I need to account for exactly what I might need to play or do on my opponent's Icy turn. Manipulator. All right, so I'm playing Icy Manipulator here, and I'm electing to play this over Jam Day Tome. The reason I'm doing that is Mikel has been, uh, he doesn't have, obviously, any more creatures in his hand, which means either his hand is entirely choked with land or it's reactive cards. And in the first game that we played, he actually let me keep a Jalen Tome and play the whole game. So the fact that he hasn't destroyed the Jalen Tome is an indication to me, is, or I should say is not an indication that he doesn't have Artifact Kill in his hand. It's just that he's holding on to Artifact Kill for stuff that he deems to be more important than a Jalen Tome. So I'm kind of worried about the longevity of the Icy Manipulator. I, I'm sorry, the Jam Day Tome, and I really want it to survive. And I have Divine Offering in my hand right now. That's a very, very important factor. So obviously, I'm going to play, I'm going to play the one of the four mana artifacts. But I'm leading with the Icy Manipulator here on in the chance that he has either regular Artifact Kill, or most importantly, if he has the card Detonate in his hand, which I'm absolutely considering as a range of things he might be holding here. And if he's going to detonate something. I want it to be an Icy Manipulator or a Jam Day Tome because that means I'm going to be able to divine offering in response, kill the artifact, counter effectively counterspell the detonate, and gain four, which is an eight point life swing, absolutely gigantic when I'm at just five life. So the Icy Manipulator is basically played here in anticipation of him potentially holding detonate and giving me an opportunity to get the detonate out of his hand, making it safe for Jam Day Tome to come down and potentially dig me out of this. That's great. Okay. So now Mikkel is really in. Um, and he didn't use his land tech, so that means the, the, the no, land he, he counters. Could, they're, he they're could, even. Right? Yeah, we're tied in land. And there probably are no lands left really in the deck anyway. But, the but I think he's doing okay on land. I don't yeah, think he needs yeah, the yeah. land techs now. He's filled with his, up, his library. Tapping a bunch. Yeah, when I saw the five mana here, I knew exactly what was coming and just felt so glad that I played the uh, the Icy over the Jam Day Tome. Sort of worked out pretty much as perfectly as I could have hoped. Ooh, detonate uh, on the Icy. That's what uh, you talked about, what happened to you as well, right? So that means four yeah. points of Brian's damage. Brian's got to counter it. He's got to counter it. Or Divine Offering his own Icy. Good call, Ken. What is he going to do? There it oh, is. Oh, yep. Divine Offering. Oh, what a nice play. 
that will give him four more life going up to 10. Yeah, and that's what Brian needed. He needs to climb out of big fireball range. Yeah, but, you can, know, what can, Brian offering is, is very nice. It nullifies the detonate. I mean, that's an eight-point swing right there. Wow. So it's a timely spell. So and counting the lands of Mikael, I think one, two, five, six, seven, eight. He's got nine lands, but of course he's going to play number ten next turn. But right. So Miguel his... has Miguel has six cards in his hand, and we have. So you notice there, actually, at the end of his turn, I'm tapping City of Brass and Underground Sea to draw with Jalen Jalen Tome, which seems honestly a little bit crazy if I'm at ten, because right now Mikel has nine land in play, and he. Presumably has another land in hand due to all the million land taxes, which means he'd be able to cast an X spell for nine damage on his next turn with a total of 10 land in play. And if I were at 10, I'd actually have to think a long time about whether or not it was worthwhile for me to take even one extra point of damage, because that would make the difference of dying to an X spell versus having another turn. Although effectively at this stage in the game, one turn is just equal to another card drawn. So it's kind of a wash either way. But the fact that I'm at nine here, means that I'm already dead to an X spell, and therefore there's nothing, there's no harm whatsoever in tapping the City of Brass to take a point of damage here to draw, because that's, again, the only way out. I have to think that most of them are land, um, but, you know, that means so his deck is just there, packed with, not at nine. with uh, heaters, you know? Yeah, at least I'm Brian. Next turn, Brian doesn't have to worry about a lethal fireball, at least. That's something. <laughs> I... I think he does. I definitely do. He's got one, two. No, I don't think he has enough mana no. right now. I mean, yeah, he's, he's just out of range. But I mean, cards like City of Brass and also the Side Blast that Brian just discarded, they just seem so bad against when you're playing against Burn, right? Because yeah, you don't want to help your opponent. Yeah. And not, not, not that Miguel's deck is completely burned, that's not true. But I mean, you want to hold the Side Blast back for the Angel. Um, or the juggernaut or something, but um, yeah, yeah, but you, you know, don't, I don't think Brian can afford to exchange the life at this point. So he's looking through his graveyard, which means he's likely just got his recall. I, I do believe I, I actually uh, have recall in my. I'm now. thinking right now, reverse damage. That could be a card that could work. Um, he's, it's a one-time shot, it's not and it's. With it. Reverse damage is good at the very end of the game, but it doesn't, you know, I I, I would almost rather have a uh, a force spike in some instances <laughs> or a flash counter or something. So he's going to recall for one, it looks that like. That is true, but it is That's interesting to think about, like, if your no fear is yet. to be killed by a giant fireball and oh, it's keeping Okay, so now he's got four. A book, there it is. Okay. Double so now, this, now he can start doing what he wants wants to do the most, right? From a control position, get card advantage? Yeah, so Brian doesn't need, you know, now he's gonna, he's gonna be looking at a possibility of like three cards a turn. Um, and, and you know, kind of claw his way back in, but everything that Mikkel draws, well, there's the Pendlehaven, so he must have drawn that. But, you know, for the most part, Mikkel is drawing, you know, threats and answers. So Brian needs to really accelerate his, his get his draw engine on board as soon as possible and start this is, looting. This is another 1-1 one, one from uh, Fallen Empires, right? And you can pay one to give it banding, and you can pay one to give it first strike. Yeah, it's a great creature. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. I don't think it's bad. I think it's better than Pikeman, to be honest. Totally, totally correct. No, poor Pikeman. Way better. Oh, Sarah there's Angel. Sarah Angel. And there's the psionic blast in the graveyard that I just oh. mentioned he would walk for the oh. angel, right? Yeah. All right. So it's pretty obvious that uh, I think on that turn, he, I think he certainly had both Pendlehaven and Sarah Angel in his hand. I think he drew the Acacian Infantry that turn because he would have probably followed up the Detonate with uh, by playing the Acacian Infantry. The fact that he played the Detonate last turn over the Sarah Angel was uh, extremely helpful because obviously I had the perfect counter to it, although I did have the Sonic Blast in my hand to deal with the Angel that's now looking in the grave or sitting in the graveyard. So here we are. Uh, we are now probably about 12 or 13 point turns into the game. I'm sitting here at 7 life. I have Jam de Tome active, although it's going to take me a point of damage to, to use it. I've actually discarded a number of answers to Sarah Angel already. Um, my opponent, Mikkel, I believe has 4 or 5 cards in his hand, a huge mana base, all of his X spells remaining, 
and I have my two card drawing engines and an indeterminate hand, but right at the moment I have no counter spells at all. This game is as tenuous as they come. I've been given a little bit of a reprieve with my life total, but it could still go either way. And I believe that I've already been covering this match for roughly an hour. So I think this makes a perfect jumping off point to part two, which I will be producing and posting probably within the next day or so. Hope you guys enjoyed the coverage so far. I think it's been uh, quite a nail biter and it is far from over. So stay tuned for that. I will see you guys all very soon. Thanks for watching.